it's indie wrestling and using handrails to get indie tub. It's the outdated wrestling hour. Welcome back, everybody, to the Outdated Wrestling Hour. My name's Bob Smith, formerly with Pro Wrestling Illustrated Magazine, way back when. Great to have you back, and it's great to have uh, our guest, Rick Del Santo, who is going to be our interview subject on this particular program. We're going to talk a little bit about WrestleMania, and we're going to talk about the world of podcasting. We're going to talk about what's going on in, in his neck of the woods and what he's doing in professional wrestling and a lot of other stuff. We're just going to go where the conversation takes us and hopefully it takes us to a very enjoyable place. So enough of my yak and we'll get right to it. First, we're going to have a little bit of a, a message from somebody you wouldn't expect to hear his voice on this show. But I'll tell you what, he's got an interesting thing to say about a type of radio you might have thought is defunct, but no, it's still going strong. So hang on, listen to this, and we'll be right back. With the one and only Rick Del Santo. Don't you dare go nowhere else. This is Joe Walsh. One thing I do when I'm not playing rock and roll is get on the air as an amateur radio operator. Also called ham radio is a communication service provided by ordinary people just like you and me. We have a national emergency communication system in place 24-7, 365. Find out more about amateur radio at arrl.org slash what is ham radio? See you on the air. Well, you guys know how happy I am to be back in the wrestling scene in this little way that I am because it's like I'm seeing old friends again, like Bill Apter and Craig Peters and people like that. But I'm also making new ones. And I have to say this out loud to you, Rick. This is Rick Del Santo from Connecticut, and I am so happy to know you. Um, we have had so much fun talking to each other, both on and off our mutual podcasts, and it's great to have you back. It's good to see you. Bob, I want to thank you for welcoming me back to your show. This is a, It was a pleasure, and the first time I had a lot of fun, so thank you for having me back today. Well, it's, it's, um, it's a pleasure for me, too, and... Uh, we just happened to uh, be talking right after WrestleMania time, which was a very big deal. I had a lot of fun going to Philadelphia for, I wasn't at the card, but I was in the periphery of it and did a few things while I was there. I, like I said, I did a radio appearance when I was there and it all went swimmingly. And you should have seen it, man. Philly was just, Philly was WrestleMania crazy. I was there on, I, I got there on Thursday and it's like all the, like the, there were banners everywhere with the, the faces of the WWE superstars everywhere on every flagpole, every, every telephone pole. You know how they do that yeah. at, at, in main streets around the country now, but it was all WWE. People were dressed in, you know, wrestling garb everywhere you looked. You could feel it as early as Thursday, you know, wow. the whole town. And I, I said this on the NPR show I was on. That had to have been a Taylor Swift-like economic boon to Philadelphia. You figure two nights, 70000 each night, hotels, restaurants, peripheral things. There was a convention right there in Center City at the same time. Bars and restaurants had wrestling-themed nights. The Blue Meanie was, was the host of something at McCleskey's Tavern there. You go on down the list, Cash Cow City, man, it had to have been really good for the city. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it seemed like it might've been a lot of fun, maybe just a little bit, but, uh, you know, 
a lot of people that were up here that I know from up here that that actually took the whole week and then went down there just starting with Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday going to like tons of indie events. I thought uh, once somebody that I worked with went uh, to the GCW Collective, spend the whole entire weekend uh, going to those shows as well. I just I don't know. It's it's always this time of year I get kind of sick of professional wrestling for a few days. You know what I mean? Because like, I'm right. watching that one week. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you, you know, you brought up another point. There were there were cards all over the place. Yeah, there were cards in backyards. There were cards in you know, I think in the uh, old twenty three hundred arena. There was all kinds of stuff going on, yeah. and I just was upset that I couldn't stay longer than I did. But you know, I am still working and. I, I have to do two things at once all the time, the podcast and the day job. So you know how that goes. But uh, it was just kind of refreshing. And it didn't rain that day. It didn't rain Thursday. It was raining for like for 20 days, it felt like, before that. And I was able to take Amtrak in and it all went well. But now that I've I've experienced that and watched the entire program, I did not watch the Hall of Fame. I have, I have yet to see that. But what were your impressions of the two days of this gigantically mounted entertainment spectacle. How much did you enjoy it? I probably like 90%. Okay. Cause it was, I mean, if you break down some of the things to complain about, it really doesn't add up to like all the good stuff that happened. Like remember last year, I think we were both in agreement that uh, WrestleMania was probably one of the best WrestleManias in the history of WrestleMania. This one's pretty far up there. I think uh, I, I really enjoyed, um, I could complain about the main event both nights a little bit. Uh, oh, oh! Listen, it, after the first after the first night, I thought that was a debacle. Yeah, it was. You know, uh, the outside interference interference festival as usual, which I've been watching for three years, and I'm sick of it. And I didn't like the way it was handled, and I just thought it made Cody look weak. You know, going down the list. Um, but they made up for it. They yeah. really did. I mean. I still think that the way they have booked Cody, he's he's coming up from behind too much. Like, you wouldn't consider him, if he's going to be champion, he ain't going to be a dominant one because he's always down. You know what I'm saying? It seems like he spent the better part of six months getting his ass handed to him on TV. Right? right. Yeah. No, I guess you're right. Yeah. So, you know, a guy like Roman Reigns, even though he's a miserable cheater and an outside interference specialist... He's still an imposing physical fi- figure, a large man, very powerful, very yeah. good. That's Cody, a, Cody, uh, Cody is a little undersized, and I get the feeling you can't paint him. He's going to be the ultimate underdog champion from this point in. I think that's the way they're going to have to market him. I think that makes sense. I mean, who's he? Who's he going to be lined up against coming going forward? That's the other. The uh, who do you think that uh, they're going to have him against? Uh, you know, I'm going to. Here is a pick. I don't know if they're going to do it right away, but you know, Gunta is going to get a chance. Okay. Yeah, which I would like to see. I think that would be awesome. Yeah, because they they can both go. So that I think that would work very very well. You know, you know that Roman Reigns isn't out of the picture. You know, and you know, there's reports that there's more bloodline joining the, the team soon. I, I, yep. I my question is: Is the Rock out? Is he back? Is he out? Is he sticking around, or is he? Uh, you know, has he done his thing? I don't know. I guess we'll find out because my thing is, I expected him to turn on Roman Sunday night, which did not happen. Right. So um, that was just a prediction of mine. I think a lot of people thought that was going to happen, but uh, it didn't end up happening. So I think it is definitely in the cards in the, the to come. So I don't think we're going to see the end of The Rock anytime soon. Right. Yeah. I wonder if we'll see the end of The Bloodline, though. Because you yeah. know what? It really is played out. I mean, it, it, you've seen it for three years. Uh, anything gets old. I always equate it to the Sheik burning out Detroit with the same match over and over again. Right. It's the same match over and over again for Roman Reigns. So I, I, I would almost like to see him turn back face again, to be honest with you. Yeah, that is my next um, assumption that I was thinking about today, that I wouldn't be surprised if that happened either, because it's just the... The way that they portrayed him afterwards and online, uh, that, you know, thank you, that he was one of the, supposedly one of the greatest champions in WWE history. I'm disagreeing for that with, uh, you know, uh, they've built him a certain way. And I, I don't I don't know if I'm going too far off uh, the subject here, but it's like, you know, while he was a, he's great at what he does, it's he's always had to rely on Jay, Jimmy, Solo Sokoa, and Paul Heyman to come in and 
help him. Not a lot of other really world champions I haven't seen done that, even as heel. If that makes sense. Uh, I can only equate him, this sounds silly, to the honky-tonk man. But, I mean, this consists... Who had Peggy Sue and Jimmy Hart to interfere for him. You know, it, it's like, I hate to say it, but that was their shtick, too. Yeah. And I like you say, but on the world championship stage, <laughs> no, it hasn't been that blatant. But, yeah. you know, I, I, and again... But WWE has a has an over tendency to use outside interference as a way of life. If you mm-hmm. watch your episode of Raw or SmackDown, you'll see outside interference three to five times in every show. Yeah, not to mention somebody get thrown through the table on every show too. Yeah, I mean they just might as well remove tables. I mean it's just you know because it's it's too predictable that that's going to happen on every single show. You every know, single show, every single you know show. There's be a table spot. You know there's going to be a belt being used. You know there's going to be you know, a chair shot, uh, every single show. It's very predictable. There's a formula there. Uh, Rams the- in the rig steps. There's another one. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah. Using them as a weapon. Um, oh, this is one that I pointed out the other night while me and my wife were watching Mania when Cody speared Roman through the side barricade. And it's like, that's a thing. That one section never seems to hook it up properly. They always send them through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that one section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just the one. Yeah. Like if they, it's never on the far side of the ring. It's always no. near right, right? Right past yeah. the announcer's table. Boom. Out they go. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's you would, getting a little played out to me as well. It's just, it's, it, all right, maybe the first time it was like, oh, man, that's pretty cool. But now, not so much. Yeah. But there's the thing. Once you, once you, you can't beat, again, the chic factor. You do it over and over and over again. It gets rote and people get tired of it. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, so I'm really hoping that with Triple H at the helm, who really knows his stuff, then maybe he'll notice it too. Uh, you know what I'm saying? In, in terms of the... of the, uh, But h- here here you and I are talking like this, and they are printing money right now. I mean, it, it's like, this may be their most successful period ever in terms of sheer profitability. I mean, it, they're everywhere. So who am I to say? You know, they're, they're filling... They just filled a f- football stadium with 70,000 people two nights in a row. Yeah. Who am I to say they're doing it wrong? Yeah, I mean, they're making money, so I guess that's everything that's right. But like I said, uh, it's WWE is one of those brands, you know what I mean? Like a mainstream brand, like a Coca-Cola or a McDonald's or something like that. That's associated with, you know, McDonald's with cheeseburgers, Coca-Cola with cola. It's just that's what people go to, and that's where all the money is because people are going to be like, "There you go." <laughs> <laughs> I just held up my Coke, folks. <laughs> people are going to go to that because that's what they know. You know what I mean? As far as professional wrestling goes, and that's where all the money is. And you know what surprised me over the course of the last month or so with The Rock coming back, him dropping f bombs left, right, and sideways on uh, on like you say, this is kind of a national brand. And he's dropping f bombs left, right, and they're trying to bleep it out, but they're not always being successful doing it. I question that. You know that that's the stuff that AEW has been doing those undersized amateurs to get heat. You don't need to do it in WWE. It's not necessary. I, I thought I, I think he shouldn't be doing it. I really do. I, I think that's a step too far. People are going to watch regardless. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, the, 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 that brand. People are not as offended by curse words as they were even 20 years ago. I, I think, you know. No. It's a, I, it's... I don't. I tend not to use them on this show. I, I, I really catch myself wanting to curse and holding it back because I just, you know why everybody else is doing it. That's why. I just I just want to be something that in case somebody's listening and they get offended. I don't want to offend anybody. I'd, I'd rather be the old fashioned radio guy and just avoid the cursing. I, you know, not that not that I haven't had guests that had done it, and that means I get the little e on my podcast. Uh, like you, you ever see that? Yeah. When there's ex- for explicit language, right? Yeah. Uh, I I try not to use them. I used to be way worse than I am now. <laughs> but you know, because we used to but back in the day, we used to maybe have a little fun drink a little bit while we were doing the podcast. <laughs> a lot of words used to fly around, but uh, as I got a little bit, you know, more serious about it, I got a little more serious and tried to not use it, uh, not use words, language as much. But well, yeah, I, that's a part of normal television as a whole, though, these days. Yeah, and most people are watching HBO and Netflix like their normal normal networks, and they curse a blue streak on every show. Yeah. yeah, you yeah know, and, so... 
see it on ABC or network television as well as dropping. Uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say the f f bombs, but uh, but you know what? You'll hear the f- in this in the in the worst word, and then hear the beef. So you know what they said. You know, it's it's like they they kind of half hide it, yeah. not fully hide it. So right. yeah. again, I'm no prude. I don't care what anybody says. But you know what? Kids are watching, and yeah. in fact, a lot of kids are watching. I was at a Target three weeks ago. And when I go to Target, for some reason, I, would, I wouldn't I would buy one on a dare. And I'm not against anybody who does. But I go to the toy section and I look for the wrestling figurines. And there they are. Or, or I don't know what they call them anymore. What do they call them? The action action figures? Or they action figures. Yes, whatever you call them. And I walked in and to my surprise, there was a selection of AEW and WWE figures. Yeah, I um. I used to take my son to buy figures all the time. He, when I've, I don't think I've ever encountered AEW figures in my Walmart or Target. I mean, at a convention or two, I have, but never in the store. It's well, they had a bunch of them at my local Target, and it is the funny part. They had some of the most obscure AEW wrestlers at Target. They had what's the what's the one where uh, it was a tag team? Oh, the Butcher. Oh, Butcher and the Blade, that guy. Yeah, they had yeah. to butcher the figurine. I'm like, who? Who would buy it? I mean, yeah. they don't have him, but who was it? All right, so I'm looking at these obs- and some Mexican looking guy I never heard of, and I'm I'm going through these, and I see there's some John Cena there for WWE, and then I, as God is my witness, this is what occurs. I'm staring at these things. I'm just standing there staring and reading them. Here comes a little kid. He's got one wrestling figure in each his hand, and here comes his mom. 35-ish mother with the shopping cart. And he goes, I need these. You need those? She said, she wasn't yelling. She wasn't even questioning it. She said, you need those? She said, yeah, I don't have these. I want these. Okay. Now we got to call your dad and see which ones he has. I said, what? I'm just watching this. <laughs> right? I'm watching this. And we'll call it. So I hear, dad, which ones do you have? Do you have? And they read every doll. They walked out of there with three quarters in the inventory at that target. I just happened to be standing there at just that right time. Wow. The market for wrestling figurines is off the charts. I want to do I want to do a, a show on wrestling collectibles because I haven't done one yet. Because I don't know squat about it. I really don't. To me, it was something I never really got into. Like al- although back when I was with PWI, I had an Abdul the Butcher Remco figure and a Harley race uh LJN or whatever it was. The LJN. King, the King Harley race, yeah. I, and, I actually, um, just saw the, the Remco Abbey at uh, at somebody at a convention I just went to in Springfield, Mass, had a bunch of those Remco figures at rather cheap prices. And I, you know, like a dummy, I passed them up. I should have bought them. I want yeah. them. <laughs> what yeah. I them though? Like, I, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, what am I doing at my age? Yeah. What am I doing at my age with figurines? They're going to yeah. outlive me at this point. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to. You know, I I pass the point of collecting them, and I'm at the point now where I'm getting rid of things, you know, as opposed to bringing things in. I mean, yeah. I'm a watch collector, and I stop because, like, how much time do I have left? And I don't want to remind myself, you know. But anyway, yeah. so anyway, this we got off, we got off guard there. But there's my wrestling figure story, and I was I was I was just astounded. They they fill half filled the shopping cart with those black AEW boxes. And I'm like, wow. Know. They're not cheap. They're like twenty, twenty five dollars. Yes, they are. Depending on where you live and where that store is located, it's. Uh, well, have you have you seen these companies that are coming out with these beautiful, realistic new limited edition figures? There's all these companies making these these dolls now, and they look fantastic. Right. And they're like eighty, ninety, a hundred dollars. So there are different levels of collecting, I guess. Uh, yeah, I amazing. Mean, the the pop culture collectability. Uh, stuff i don't know how to describe it but those people are nuts really man i mean like i'm sitting here trying to get rid of stuff and these people are spending hundreds of dollars on brand new figures that are you know buying whole sets of stuff i guess they put out didn't they just put out like a stan hansen figure or it's coming out yeah and, yeah uh, i saw that yeah brody and, and a couple others for some other i mean i saw them at this convention in springfield that, uh, that i referenced before and they look amazing but i'm just like damn these things were so expensive just yeah no, it's just the collectability is just amazing at this day and age. Well, you know, my staff announcer on this show is me, you know, and I look at it and go, what are you doing collecting dolls that you're, you know, I, it's like, why would you buy, why would you buy this, Bob? Why would you want yeah. this? 
So I, I need to get, I want to get somebody that's in the business. If you, you within the sound of my voice, wrestling, figuring people, I'd like to have a guest on the show who uh, will come on and explain this whole industry to me because I am blissfully unaware of how this works. And I, I want to know more. And if people are into it, I like to point them toward that, you know, because just because I'm not into it doesn't mean others aren't. So right. I, I, and I want to learn how the, the history, like I said, back in the nineties, I had two figures cause they were like five bucks back then, you know, they weren't an <laughs> like, like they are now, to be honest with you. All right. Enough of this. Enough of this. I'm sorry. The, I veered off. Figures of literally everybody now, as opposed to then it was like a lot of the top stars. Now, like every mid card guy gets a figure and yeah. it, like every single person gets a figure. Referees, everybody, announcers. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has. A piece of merchandise these days. It's incredible. Yeah, it is. So, okay, okay, let's get back to WrestleMania. And I, I'll tell you what. So it's the main event. As we speak, this was last night as we're recording this, folks. So this is Monday evening when uh, Rick and I are talking now. And it's the end of the thing. And Cody emerges victorious. There's not a dry eye in the house. There's real emotion in that arena over this. Mm-hmm. For for a bunch of different reasons, and I won't go into that, but I will say this. It's really late in the broadcast, and they've, they've been showing the celebration in the ring, celebra- celebrating outside the ring. And you hear Michael Cole say, and I'm I'm paraphrasing, I love professional wrestling. He yeah. didn't say I love WWE. He didn't say I love sports entertainment. He said, I love professional wrestling. And I think you hear Corey Graves say, I love professional wrestling too. And you know, but, uh, it was this, who was the third announcer last night who was driving me absolutely crazy. Pat McAfee. That oh, guy. McAfee was just oh. Oh, nails on a chalkboard. And, and the more exciting, the action got the worse he was. Yeah. Ugh. The one of the things I can't say, like he gets very overly excited. He starts standing on the table. still got the headset on screaming, yelling. And it's just like, well, shtick I can deal with, but not yeah. during commentary. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, Paul Heyman referenced uh, professional wrestling as well Friday night during the right. speech. I know that you didn't uh, see it, but he starts talking. He's like, something something sports entertainment. And it stopped mid-sentence, crossed it out, and said, and then yelled out professional wrestling. And I I mean, I was smiling ear to ear when he said that. Dude. He, well, it, it, he was jabbing at Vince. And, you know, I mean, it seemed like the professional wrestling is back, I guess. Well, here's the deal. Do you feel this like I do? Because this was the healthiest thing for. I've been saying over and over again that the emergence of women in wrestling is the healthiest thing to happen in 30 years. Mm-hmm. However, probably the healthiest thing to happen in 10 years is the WWE using the term professional wrestling and wanting to. Yeah. That's got to be coming from Triple H. It's That's got to it's got to be a new mindset, a new paradigm. And boy, does that sound good. I mean, I know it's just a statement. The, yeah. You know, there's going to be a raw tonight that could be, you know, the drizzling poops, you know, it, it might be lousy. But the fact is, if they're veering toward traditional professional wrestling again, I don't know what to say other than, wow, I didn't expect to hear that at all. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a very exciting time. Professional wrestling is alive and well. And now I guess the leader of the industry is, uh, I guess, back in a way, you know. No, oh, they're more than back. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like I say, they're printing money. It's 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 crazy how popular they are. Yeah. And I, I always go back, and I, I talk about this too much, but I remember I always go back to 1991 when I was at the Meadowlands covering Ric Flair versus Sting for the old NWA World Title, mm-hmm. and Flair regained it that night. Right. And the assembled press was myself. After was there, and two guys from somewhere I didn't know. Meltzer was in the building, but he wasn't at the post. There wasn't a press conference. We were just talking to Ric Flair. That was it. That was the assembled media. Mm-hmm. Now, as I always say, Forbes has a wrestling writer. New York Post has a wrestling writer. CBS Sports website covers pro wrestling. Yeah. Website after website. And I'm not talking wrestling websites. You know, the ones that are dedicated, to, you know. Major news outlets. Major news outlets are covering yeah. professional wrestling. Yeah. Phil Muchnick has hated professional wrestling for 30 years, yet there's a wrestling writer in the Post now, New York Post. Right. So it's entirely changed the way it's looked at, perceived, covered. In a, in a lot of ways, I think that that's great. In another way, it's, I think it's awful mm-hmm. because, and I'm, I get off my lawn, <laughs> they fling the door open too wide. 
You can't surprise anybody anymore. If this is like a, a surprise appearance, I am surprised people didn't know that The Undertaker and Cena were going to be there. And I had heard rumors about Cena. Well, I think they said on microphone, you know, on air that, you know, a couple people were in the building. Never Undertaker was never mentioned, but I think they said Cena was there. And I'm like, huh, but they haven't shown him. But the thing with it, like, you're right, the door's flung wide open. But the other thing is, Nobody can, none of these guys can interfere because then they're just music hits. And that's the one thing that drives me nuts. Oh yeah. That's, that's the most unrealistic thing they do. Yeah. That's so so unrealistic. And it's, it's like 45 seconds before you actually see the person. Yeah. But the the other thing is like, yeah, so they can, if this is a legitimate one-on-one fight, that guy has time to prepare himself. That's the other thing. Yeah. And if they're, if they're running half the length of a football field to get into the ring, which they were. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you could play half his theme song by the time he gets in the ring. It's crazy. You're right. It's it's so. Ugh. And did the Undertaker hide under the ring the entire evening? That's the other question I have because he just he popped up rather quickly too. So you know what's funny about that spot? The lights go out. You hear bong, right? Or you hear bong and then the lights go out. Right. The place My goes wife, ape. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, Bob. My, I was waking. I was. You know, my wife was going to sleep and she heard that bong and then like she was asleep and then she just like woke up and she got excited about this. Mm-hmm. Like, not a wrestling fan by any stretch, but uh, that's like one moment like there's very it takes a lot for her to get very excited. Though. I was like, I, I mean, I like sharing moments like that with her. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. Here's that spot. Right. This is how I know I've been watching wrestling too long. They do the spot. He does the choke slam on on you know, the rock. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And then bong lights out again. And I'm thinking, oops, lights out. The ring's going to be cleared. And it was. Okay. He's gone. Everybody else is out. And I think there was just um, even the rock. Even the rock wasn't in the ring when the light came back up, which is a typical Undertaker thing, right? Right. So the fact that I've been watching it for so long, I said, well, well who's going to be left in the ring? Because somebody's leaving the ring in the dark. And how did the rock, who was hurt, leave the ring? <laughs> yeah, it got laid out, right? Yeah. It, well, yeah. So, you know, it's, again, when you try to look for realism in today's wrestling, sometimes it's woefully not there. You know, and, and that's the thing. I think with just a little more TLC, wrestling could be a lot more realistic and retain its entertainment value. Maybe it's uh maybe it's maybe it's coming still. Maybe it's coming still. This is just the beginning. So mm-hmm. yeah, you know, we saw I think we saw a huge shift last night. And um I don't know. I mean I'm just it's something to look forward to. Wrestling there's so much wrestling out there these days, you know. Well, so you, you're gonna be surprised here for from this old fart, but I'm excited too. I, I there's just something about what happened last night that just just again, it didn't hit me at first. It hit me after like five minutes. And I'm like, this feels different. You know, this, it, 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 you got a vibe from the people in the ring that it was different. The fact that they had the major stars there and congratulating Cody Rhodes out of character. You know, they weren't in character. They were legitimately congratulating him. Yeah. You know, L.A. Knight, who's a, a relative newbie there, was in the ring. I mean, you know, they they picked, you know, R- Randy Orton, all those guys, the Usos. Or, all the major Jay, guys. So, the major yeah. face guys. Right, right. But there was genuine emotion in the ring. They weren't kayfabing the slap on the back. You know, here's, here's CM Punk raising uh, Cody's arm in victory. Yeah. Which had to make AEW fans just go berserk. <laughs> <laughs> Raspberry Law, yeah. Yeah, I mean, AEW. Let's talk a little bit. Um, rudderless ship, man. I, it just, you know, some, I did not wish them I, ill will. You now this week, this week coming up, they're going to they're gonna show backstage footage of the fight from All In. Is this, am I hearing this right? That's what I read as well. Uh, do you watch AEW on a regular basis? Or, I or? have, I glance at it on occasion because I always see something that, really offends me and i shut it off yeah um i can't tell you the last time i tuned in to it i I think it was a pay-per-view maybe and i just i think it was the sting retirement match that that event i I tuned in like halfway through and while it was of that show was particularly a good show um i tried watching their weekly tv and i just 
I'm lost on it, man. It's like it's uh I, I had a lot of hope in the beginning because it was, it was just more wrestling creates more wrestling, more more work for the people, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I just thought it was gonna be something and it's uh after a couple years, it's just I just kind of that hasn't been doing anything for me, really. I mean, I don't wish it any ill harm or any of that stuff. I, I hope them success. I just I need to get a control over there a little bit. There is there's not a wrestling fan who wanted them to fail. I, I don't want them to fail either. However, no if what, I hear if I hear one more time, well, Tony Khan gave all these people work, so that's great. Rah rah rah. Yeah, yeah. but if it's if it sucks, it sucks. I, I'm sorry. I mean, if yep. the psychology isn't there, if a lot of the things they've done are inexcusable on that show. You know, it, it, and the injuries, the, the unnecessary risks he makes his wrestlers take, and yeah. down the line it goes. Yeah, you, you want to talk about table spots. I mean, they're glorious at glorifying these gigantic stacked-up tables and glass on how many damn shows have they, sorry, pardon my language, but on how many shows have they had just uh, glass spots, and, and it's just, I, you, you know, I don't you know what else. You cannot allow professional wrestlers to book their own matches. Yeah. Yes. And this is what really kills me about AEW. You know, I worked for WCW magazine. Correct. Yep, I remember. In those years, and and the original incarnation of WCW magazine, which was done by London Publishing, the same people who did PWI. I don't know how many people realize that. But in both instances of that magazine, they they were down our throats saying, you can't print this, you can't print that, this is too extreme, you can't do that. And I know that TBS and TNT back then were very stringent about what they could show on the wrestling shows. Dusty Rhodes got fired for getting spiked in the eye on TV once on the, on the Superstation right, on, the 60, on the 605 show. Remember this? He yeah, got fired. He got fired for that. Yeah, now, right. now they're practically guillotining each other in the ring and they're letting it all go. The bad language and blood, blood, blood. And not that I have anything against those things. I'm just saying the difference between when I was around for WCW and the same network showing what they show now is it's such a chasm. I can't believe it. This also goes back to like what we were talking about earlier. It's a different time. Things have opened up a little bit more as right. far as what people can do on TV, what people can say on TV. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't make it any better, make it any worse. It's just, it's just, they have a little bit too much freedom sometimes. So maybe, yeah. Um, but the thing with the AEW is it's like, there's always blood. Always. It's like, I don't yeah mind watching a nice good bloody match but it has to make sense you don't walk out there and all of a sudden moxley just loves to bleed no oh, matter yeah. what she has so you know I, I i um it's just one of those things like i said it's got to make sense and a lot of times just the lot that goes on over there just doesn't make sense the psychology of blood like I said, I watched my first wrestling match in 19... Or my first wrestling fandom took place in 1970. I'm older than many kinds of soil, okay? Now, here's the deal. Blood was always used judiciously and special. It was always special. It wasn't a common thing. If you even went to your local local favorite wrestling cards, you'd see it once every three shows or something like that, at least on the East Coast. Memphis right. is a whole different... Well, oh, Axe in Florida, too, and, you know, Kentucky, all those, all those places where they brawled more there. Yeah. But here's the thing. Has anybody learned anything from Superstar Graham? Right? Yeah. Right? It yeah. is dangerous to commingle blood. I'm sorry, children. It is a dangerous thing to drink the blood of another person, kids. Didn't that alpha that happened on the NWA show what so what last year? I think it was. It was um Well, it happened on AEW too in one of their yeah. uh, Oh, pay-per-view with, uh, events well, with Swerve right? Strickland yeah. and uh, Paige, I guess. And I think in the NWA, it was Silas Mason and Kratos, maybe? Where ah. is, and, and I love both men. I think they're both very talented and, and good at what they do. And I think it was Silas, uh, like Kratos busted open. He was bleeding a gusher in that mat. And he just, that's it. He licked it. And I was just like, this is just disgusting. Well, you know, even back in the eighties, people forget this. The Road Warriors used to do it when they were when they were their earliest yeah. biker Road Warriors. Yeah, the they used to lick the blood. And Kamala did it. There was a bunch of people who did that. Yeah. But you're supposed to learn from the mistakes of others, folks. Superstar Graham lived like a cripple the last thirty years of his life, mm -hmm. and you would figure somebody would notice that and figure out why. Right? Because you know, it hurt his organs and everything else. He had hepatitis and other other problems. 
I, I, I again, bloodborne diseases are a serious thing, and I'm not against blood in wrestling. I'm not against violence in wrestling, hmm. but when it, like you say, when it becomes like a polite greeting in an AEW match, like it's, it has to be done. Yeah. Like, like it used to be like a referee stance at the beginning of a match. Now they're just slicing each other open. Uh, uh-uh, uh, no, it, it, grow up kids. I mean, seriously, no, yeah. now you, you, you're involved with professional wrestling in Connecticut, right? I call you an impresario, but what's your title? Uh, I, I've made many hats really, but I do a lot of play by play announcing for various groups in Connecticut and in out of uh, Massachusetts, Springfield and Holyoke, Massachusetts as well. So I've expanded uh, in the last year. <laughs> Very the, good. Nice to, to those, hear that. To those two cities. But yeah, I work uh, for several different independents uh, doing play by play for I guess, their live streams, videos, uh, and some of them even have uh, online television series as well. That's awesome. Now, let me, let me ask the philosophy of these organizations. Mm-hmm. Is it anything like AEW, or are they a little more judicious in who they're presenting their cards to? Is it a more of a family audience or a hardcore audience? Like, what are they presenting? Well, the main groups that I work for, Coliseum Pro Wrestling and New Age Wrestling, two different companies, there, but they're kind of sister companies as we exchange a lot of talent. One's in Springfield, Mass, and one's based right out of New Haven, Connecticut. Um, they both... Coliseum does a little is kind of a little bit more edgy, but not necessarily, you know what I mean? But they don't do anything crazy. We've only had blood one show out of the three years. We're about to have our three year anniversary show at the end of this month. Out of the three years, there's been blood one time in the entire existence of the company. And um, you know, New Age is more of the family oriented, old school. We try to gear towards and get children in and uh you know, entertain the whole family. It's affordable pricing and, and all that stuff. And they're a lot, it's, they're really fun shows as well. Yeah, I give, I give credit for that. And you know who I want to give credit to back in my day? Um, it was Mario Savoldi. Yeah. It was his IWCCW. They had all the stars and a whole mess of other people and some young kids that came in at the end. And it was the last televised in my area it was in your area too right they showed it where you were right yeah i would i mean it was you, you it was, could oh i'm i don't i don't mean to be an old funny that because i'm not but you could bring a family to those shows yeah without even having a care in the world that you won't see anything that would be off-putting or too violent or too sexual or too or too blue anybody could attend those cards and i i think that's great you know, I just do it. it. It was an alternative that you, you know, and it was affordable and everybody could go and have a good time. And I get the feeling that a lot of the indies, um, you have it two ways, like what you just talked about, mm-hmm. right? And then there's the deathmatch indies. Yeah. Where there where there aren't state athletic commissions in states that don't even pay them, you know, people go, oh, it's wrestling. And you go and watch a bloodbath every match for five or six matches and that bothers me too. Like I said, if people don't learn the danger in that, because again, I admire professional wrestlers. I never had the athletic ability or guts to step into a ring other than as an announcer. Right. I, I think that wrestlers, you know them, they put it all on the line just to get a prelim shot in an indie card. You know, it's hard to get in the ring and be a professional wrestler. You know better than anybody, Rick. I mean, you you probably see the struggles of these guys as they try to make their way up, right? Yeah. I mean, some of these guys are just, they're very talented guys. They put a lot of work into what we do. I go down every now and again. I hang out with uh, you. I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, Mario Mancini. From De- yeah, Fulham sure. Stuff, and uh, Paul Roma. They run a wrestling school here together. I've become pretty good friends with uh, Mario and Paul over the years. And I go down there, hang out there sometimes on Monday nights and I watch these classes and I know that these guys that like what they go through and you know, uh, it's not easy. I see some guys brand new, just walking through the door for the first time coming for the try. I know where they're going to come back the next day, Tuesday evening or not. That's, you know, that, that, that's up to them. It's if they can't handle it that Monday night and you know, it's not an easy thing to take part in. Uh, you do, you absolutely need athletic ability. Now, a lot of these athletes out there, you know, football players, they think this is easy. Wrestling is easy. It's not necessarily nearly as easy as people think it is. It's not a, today's wrestling, no. And yet there was a time when a big lumbering guy could make it just because he was big and lumbering. Yeah. Yeah, but it's different now. Yeah. 
if you're even if you're large now, they expect you to be aerial. I mean, look at a guy like Bronson Reed, right? It, quite an, an exceptional talent. He is uh, very good at what he does, and um, yeah, man, I, I really like watching him. He is he can get up there and do things that back in 1987, like <laughs> his size was not uh, thought about doing. Right. I yeah. go back to the 70s when Crusher Blackwell was young. He used to deliver that incredible drop kick he used to do. People yeah. would buy a ticket just to see him get up in the air. You know, it was crazy. And it was special because it was not every guy his size could do that. So, you know, he was the exception, I guess, to the rule. Uh, off topic, I think Bronson Reed should be a face. I think there's something really appealing in there that they're not tapping into. I really do. Imagine him, imagine him laughing or smiling. Seriously, I, I honestly think there's something in him. It's you know they always do the same thing. They they growl at the camera and they do that squinty eye thing. And you know it's and and the worst actor in the world is uh, Karrion Cross, who is always seething for no apparent reason. Right? Back off. I think if if Karrion Cross was a little less sinister, he'd be more effective. And I think I think Bronson Reed, if he lightened up, would be big coin. I really do. I, I just get the feeling that as a heel, he'd be one of 10. As a face, he'd be one of one with right. that size and that athletic ability. That's just my two cents. You just mentioned Karrion Cross, who, you know, when I first saw him in, in Impact a, a bunch of years back, I thought that, said, I don't know what, like, he got a, a pretty decent push there, but it's just, he's one of those guys that I think that he should be higher up and doing a lot more than they're giving him in a way. I thought that when he got called up to the main roster, so this is it, this is his chance. He's going to be big time up there with the guys like Seth and Drew and, and, and all those guys. I think that he should be headlining. And it's just, what, when are they going to, when are they going to see it? If they see it at all? I mean, I see something very special on that guy. The problem, there's two problems with it. Number one, he's a really bad actor. Stop <laughs> acting. Stop acting. Stop yeah. it with that bug-eyed leer. Number two is when they brought him and Scarlet into the main roster, mm -hmm. there was absolutely absolutely no explanation why they were the mystical Scarlet. Well, what does that even mean? And at yeah. one point they have tarot cards. Now they don't. What's their deal? Why are they so angry all the time? Why do they pick a few with Rey Mysterio? None of it made any sense. Yeah. You know, and so they've been booked poorly. And yeah. one of the few and, and one of the few that have, really. Because WWE has a way of bringing the best out of everybody. They don't know what to do with Kerry Cross. Yeah. But I, mean, well, I got to tell you something, though. Somewhere yeah. on this wonderful world of the interwebs that we're on right now, there is a video of Kerry Cross doing the most incredible Jesse Ventura imitation. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've seen it. It's it's pretty it's pretty awesome. How yeah. good is that? Yeah, that was awesome. It was awesome. I wish I could tell people where they were. I'll have to look it up. But in any event, no, I'm not against Kerry Cross. I just think if he if he if he was more if he had a reason to be mad, there'd be one thing. But, the, you know, he's always looking like, I'm going to kill. Why? <laughs> Why? Yeah. I, I rest my case. And Scarlett can just show up because everybody loves her just the way she is. So, you know, it's. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I think they're both extremely talented people. It's just they got to find what, is, what the right thing to do with those two are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, also with WrestleMania, I was glad to see LA Knight get the win he deserves. Um, and to be featured as one of the wrestlers who came out when Cody uh, was in the ring at the end. I, I just think I, it felt for about three months like they were dropping the ball on LA Knight. He was the hottest thing they had going at one point. But you know what happened? Here comes Randy Orton back. Yeah. So the push that LA Knight got got kind of backtracked to push Randy Orton back again. And I really think that was the factor in why you started to see a little less and he had less TV time. But I don't think it was intentional. I think they just needed to make room. Right. And I hope they don't drop the ball in LA Knight. I think they have a gold mine in that guy. He's so over. I mean, the thing is, when are they going to pull the trigger, so to speak? I mean, I've been kind of saying for years, well before his WWE run, that he's got gold. He's great at speaking. He could do, you know, he's very, he could be very comedic. With the yeah. way he's, you know what I mean? He could be hated. He could be loved. When are they going to pull the trigger? It's just, I, I would love to see that guy on top of the world, really. I, I would just happy to see him as a U.S. or Intercontinental champion, to yeah. be honest with you. I just, you know, if, if you can't see him as a world title guy, don't push him down. I mean, you know, don't be just a feud here. Like, I was a little disappointed that all he was getting was AJ Styles. 
But you know what? That was a good match. You know, <laughs> they really went at it hard and heavy, and I thought it looked great. And they're yeah. both so athletic. They were actually kind of made to face each other. And once it was over, I said, that was pretty satisfying. That was good. And AJ, I mean, obviously been watching, what, over 20 years now. That guy is just one of the greatest performers of the last 25 years, probably. I have to give him credit because I saw him in an itsy bitsy little federation in Georgia. What was it, NWA Wildside, like 25 years ago? Yep. Yep. And I thought he had the charisma of a plastic spoon. He had like, he was a <laughs> face. No, it wasn't his fault, though. He was yeah. a face. He had that Southern accent back then. And he also had like a little short haircut. Yeah. And I think he was still learning because his matches, like a lot of young wrestlers, were spot, 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 spot. I think as he has matured, he has become a good communicator, good good in the ring, great on the mic. So there's a guy who I thought was a, not even a diamond in the rough. I didn't know what to make of him. Now I think he's one of the all-time greats. I really do. I, I think there's an example of maturity creating a great long career. I think when he was working Wildside, he was also doing shots on WCW as like an undercard guy. Like a, was he really? I don't even know that. Really? Yeah, on like Worldwide and um, what's the other show they had? The secondary show, uh, Saturday Night, which became a secondary show. I guess you could call it because grew up in the eighties. That was like the in the nineties. That was the show at one point, and then it just turned it's just squash matches over the, <laughs> towards yeah. the last years. It was just you know. You know, back in 89, 90, 91, when I was getting the tapes from Atlanta, Joe Pettacino had that eight-hour wrestling block. Of, yeah. They had, it mixed in there right after the big timers. They would put this little tiny Georgia Federation. I can't even remember what it was called. I can't remember what they called this little show they had. But on that show, they had Buff Bagwell. They had Sid Vicious. Yeah, before, they weren't calling by then. Sid Vicious was Sid Vicious, but Buff Bagwell was Marcus Alexander Bagwell. No, he was the right. handsome stranger. Okay, I mean, I remember him in Global under that gimmick. Yeah, uh, yeah. But they were Scott? they were all on this Georgia show, and other guys too that went on. They had veterans like Joel Deaton, Abdullah the Butcher came in at one point. It was a little show in front of like nineteen people. This little tiny place, and no. I can't remember what the place. Nick Busick was there, and he eventually yeah. he got he got signed with the WWF not long after that. If I remember correctly, there was another. I think it was um either Georgia All-Star Wrestling or, or something similar to that, that it, they took some older name of some older, you know, territory. And they, there was an early 90s promotion that, mm -hmm. uh, that name, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, I forgot. I think it was somebody that I interviewed not so long ago, whether it be, um, what's the guy's name? Craig Johnson, maybe? Oh, yeah. Was, okay. Maybe he was talking about it with me or or uh, somebody. Maybe it was, I'm trying to remember who who mentioned it to me, but... They had spoken about it, and and uh, and all these guys were in there. A lot of major top stars were in there at one point, and it did not last long, basically. Right, right. Which well, a lot they, of these back then with television did. They didn't last very long, just a few months sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure when the block went off, that was it for them too. You yeah. Know, it's If that's the same show. I yeah. cannot remember for the life of me the name of the show, but I loved it because it was, you know, it was guys in the way up and veterans like Joel Deaton and – yeah. Billy Black was another guy that was there. You know what I'm saying? That that bunch yeah. from the area. And um, yeah. I liked Joel Deaton. I thought he had star making material, but I guess the promoters didn't. I, it, it He's one of those guys that I looked at and go, why isn't he, you know, somewhere? Tony Anthony, too. Oh, oh Teal. Right. Yeah, that Teal Hopper thing was just, oh. Ugh. By the time you got the WWF at that time period, a lot of those territory guys that did a run there got a lot of seriously bad gimmicks out. That oh, gosh. Thing. Oh, yeah, the goon, the baseball guy, knuckleball Schwartz. Um, everybody was, you know, Duke the dumpster. Everybody was a very broad character. And they had a second, uh, second job, basically. You they, know. They, they even made Dusty Rhodes look like a pizza. I mean, it was just, it was just what it was. You know, we all lived through it. Yep. Oh, you There's know what? Do you agree it. with? Do you agree with me? I have Peacock, and they have all those old shows on there. I yep. find the 80s shows very hard to watch now. There's not a ton up there, really. It's there's It goes from, like, the early 80s of Championship Wrestling, and then right, there's, like, right. some, like a two years' worth of, like, challenge, and then they don't have, like, a lot of the Superstars episodes from the 80s. They, they start at, like, 1992. Right. Whatever. But, um, I mean, I think more of the 80s stuff, like World Class and... Um, Let's see the other one. World class, uh, world championship wrestling. There's a, there's enough of the other stuff, not necessarily WWF stuff, but right. 
I'll go back. I sat there and watched it, you know, a year at a time within a week of WCW or, you know, from the 80s and, and Mid-Atlantic. The Mid-Atlantic sometimes is pretty rough, I guess, sometimes, depending on my time of day. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. But some of it is hard to watch, but sometimes it's like, you know, there's some great moments because a lot of it's just matches and interviews and nothing happens. That's it. Right, right. Literally, you know. Well, here I am on, on, on Peacock or... <laughs> and I'm watching the early 80s All-Star Wrestling and Championship Wrestling before the expansion, yep. and it'd be an hour of squashes. Yep. You know? No stories, nothing. No yep. story. And they never did. They never did long, extreme. I mean, something like Bruno Zabisco was an oxymoron. But what happened is you'd have something like the Sergeant Slaughter um, angle with Pat Patterson where, you know, it was the uh, Cobra Clutch challenge, and Patterson challenged him finally, and he ends up fouling him and hitting him with the chair and all this other stuff. And but you know what I'm saying that that was rare. Mm-hmm. An angle like that was rare. The rest of it was pure squash. Yeah, and we, we didn't we didn't think we were missing anything either. That's that's the difference. Did you have uh, favorite squash guys at the time? Like, oh, you uh, mean jobbers? Yeah, well, jobbers. Yeah, Johnny yeah. Rods is the most talented person. I've ever seen that didn't get a push in the East Coast. I don't understand why he didn't. He Did lost all the time, and he was a great wrestler. Not a not a good wrestler, a great wrestler. <laughs> but from what I understand from Broadway Sunny Blaze, he was like a behind-the-scenes enforcer, as in, you know, they put him in training with Johnny Rods if somebody got out of the line and go, this is what you do. <laughs> Johnny was part of the territory since the 60s in the, the, the East Coast, and I guess he just likes his job right where it was. Yeah. I, I mean, mean Barry Seclunda late in his career did the same thing. Yeah, I remember watching him get squashed. Oh, oh geez, for years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but speaking of Rods, like I remember him watching him on like house shows. Remember the televised house shows like MSG, the spec, Spectrum, right, right. Like Johnny Rods would be on there. Or I'd catch him in ICW, the Savoldis, and like that's where he'd get to shine and put on a really great match, not just go out there and get squashed. Like you can see. Like that's when you moments like, damn, that guy is a great wrestler. That same thing happened with like Barry Horowitz one day when I was just as a kid, I just watched him get squashed every day. And then one day I saw him on a house show and I was against Paul Roma of all people. And I was like, they put on a great 20 minute wrestling match. It was just that's uh, it's so it's like Barry's one of my favorites as well. One of the things I liked about living where I did in upstate New York is uh, on the WWF cards from the 70s, early 80s, is that. <laughs> You'd have a, a, a main event, you know, a couple of name guys. Yeah. But they'd also have the so-called prelim guys face each other, and they'd do 20-minute draws. They would do, you know, one guy beats another. But that's where you could see what they could actually do. That's where right. I discovered a little guy like Steve King could actually work. Right. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. Ron Shaw was actually pretty powerful and big, and, you know, th- that's what you really found out about these guys when they gave them time to, because there was no TV, and it was just, or you're winning, you're winning, and they would go out and improvise a match, and some of them were really good, you know? Yeah, yeah, they'd go out there and have a fantastic 20-minute 20 20 minute match, and it's like, for somebody that just watches them get squashed every week, your mouth would drop, you know what I mean? You'd just be yeah. amazed. It's like, holy crap, that was a fantastic match. This guy's actually awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, once uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York, I saw Frankie Williams beat Joe Turco, and I went, he won? <laughs> right, I was younger, younger guy then. Obviously, I went yeah. Frank Williams won, and I was I was astounded. I was just floored. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I had any moments like that, like at a, at a house show. Obviously, you know, the, um, what's his name, Justin Credible, PJ Walker, when he was still relatively new. When he remember when he went out, he beat uh, Mike Rotunda, IRS. Literally in the New Haven Coliseum, he had a 20 minute draw with Mike Rotunda as IRS. And I was just like that. I was kind of amazed that it actually went to the time limit, and I couldn't believe. And I was, you know, still relatively older. I was like in my later teens, but the fact that they put that on a house show, a twenty minute draw between those two, just I was in amazement. That doesn't sound right now. No, it doesn't. It no, doesn't. it doesn't. No. Wow, I said it'd be something to watch. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and, wish- the, and the, the throughout East Coast territory, there is the unexplained outcome. Mm-hmm. Like the Philadelphia Spectrum match where Ron Shaw beat David San Martino by submission. Yeah. And people have been asking what happened there, and nobody really knows. He won't answer it. 
No, no. I have <laughs> Ron Shaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he won't answer it. He just basically leaves it up to your imagination. So, I isn't that when David quit? Uh, roughly, I, I don't think he was long for the place after that. No, and yeah. who knows? Maybe it was just maybe it was David doing it. You know, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I know. It's one of the great mysteries of professional wrestling. It makes me love professional wrestling even more. It's just uh, it's an element of surprise and, and, and the excitement like that that makes me love professional wrestling. Me too. Uh, it, it's like, I always say, I, I look at a guy like Gene Ligon with the same respect that I have for Ric Flair. Yeah. These veterans who could get in and put on a good show. Like, he was also one of the Thunderfeet or Thunderfoots. <laughs> <laughs> And he was a different guy as a Thunderfoot as he was as a prelim guy. You know, it's like you had these versatile talents that could do one of – like Johnny Rods went to California, but he was Jabba Rook, and he was like a championship contender there. You know, it's like – it depends on how they're used. Wins and losses do not make a great wrestler. There's been many a great wrestler who didn't win all the time. Yeah. And I insist on that. I, I have seen many a fine wrestler who – for some reason or another, maybe they can't talk well on the on the mic, or maybe they're not tall enough. Or, but you look into the sixties and seventies, the guy like Mike Pappas, you know, the Greek guy, yeah, and he he was fantastic, but he was booked in such a unique way. He'd win, he'd lose, but he was still considered like a winner, like a mid card winner, and yeah. the fans loved the guy because he was really athletic and really good. Um. I don't know what my point I'm trying to make is here, but I'm just saying there have been times when a guy's a star and he's not a star at the same time. Yeah. We're just, we're putting over jobbers basically. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Like, other, like, what like point? Yeah. Mike Pappas would beat Frankie Williams, but he couldn't beat Ernie Ladd or he couldn't beat Dominic DiNucci. He couldn't beat, you know, that right. more of a star caliber of wrestler. Yeah. Pete, yeah. Sanchez, Pete Sanchez was another guy like that. Promoted well. But he couldn't beat anybody who was in a contender slot. But he would beat the pr other prelim guys. Yeah, I, I've seen him do it. I think on maybe on prime time, you know, because sometimes prime time would that that would be the only time you'd see a jobber win a match on television. With, I'm so old. I'm so old. Here I'm talking about Pete, Pete Sanchez. I love Pete Sanchez. I yeah. Mean, don't, don't forget, I'm just a little bit younger than you. Get out of here! No, you're, you've got to you've got to be twenty years younger than I am. No, not by you're, much. You look good tonight. I mean, you yeah. the beard works, by the way. You're looking good. He's got a nice, he's got a nice full beard here. It's, he's yeah. he's rocking that thing. I'm telling you guys. <laughs> so anyway, let's get on to what you're doing. Um, yes, sir. It, you're really a big part of the New England wrestling scene. Hype yourself. Tell people what you're doing, where they can go to find you and your and your work and your the organizations you work for. I work for Coliseum Pro Wrestling. I uh, consider that my home. I've been there since day one, which is, like I said, uh, June 8th. No, I'm sorry. April 26th. Sorry. Uh, that is our three-year anniversary show, Opportunity for Success. If anybody wants to come down, please go check Coliseum Pro Wrestling out on uh, social media. If you're in the, uh, I guess, New York, New Haven area, Connecticut area, it's a lot of fun. We run in a small Elks Lodge, so... Please come down. It's uh, get there early. We had their biggest show to date for the last show. We just we kept having to add rows and rows of chairs throughout the entire evening. As people <laughs> walk. It ended up being standing room only, and it was literally on fire the whole entire evening. Uh, New Age Wrestling out of Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, uh, April twentieth. Uh, there's a there's a big show coming up, um, and that's going to be a lot of fun. I promise you guys at the Dunbar Community Center. Um, you know, I work for. Uh, a couple other indies around here, they're, they're, it's a lot of fun. You know, a lot of everybody's connected in some way or another. There's a great community here in Connecticut. Connecticut is on fire right now. So that's all I got to say. There's a, actually the whole Northeast, uh, Northeastern part of the United States so is such an amazing wrestling scene right now. A lot of guys come from Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, New York. And like I said, it's, I, I'm there to witness a lot of it. And it's just a lot of fun right now. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And you're having fun, aren't you? I, I mean, as, as, as a as, as I think you're a fan of, of this stuff as much as you are uh, somebody who works there. Am I right? I am a fan <laughs> just as much. Yeah, I, there's not a day that I don't really watch professional wrestling. There's some sort or read about it uh, in the news, etc. There you go. 
Yeah. And uh, it shows. I, I can tell there's something about you tonight. I, I can tell you are having a, a really good time and being real successful at what you're doing. I'm glad to see it because you know what? You are a one class act. Thank you. you really are. Thank and you. let's talk a little bit before, before we wrap up here. Um, it was about a year ago, I think, that I talked to you the first time on this show, right around this point, I think. I, I was just starting out on my own deal here. And I have found out over the course of the last year, I have had some outstanding highs and some bitter lows. And I have discovered how much work it is to do a weekly podcast. It is a ton of work. Am I wrong or am I doing something wacky? No, you're 100% correct. And there was times I was doing three or four a week and I was killing myself. <laughs> so Me too. Me too. Yeah. Keeping up with the podcasting world is... It's no easy, it's no easy thing. You got to put out content. Sometimes things in the episodes may be date, uh, date sensitive or whatever. So it's, you know, it's just, you got to keep on top of it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's stressful, but it's like, it's not as stressful, like get your day job type stress. You know what I mean? Right. But I will say this, I'll say this as far as I'm concerned, I will do seven interviews in a five day stretch if that's when I can get the guests. Yeah. You know, if I put one in the morning, one in the afternoon or something, I will do it that way because you can't always have access to the people you want to talk to all the time. Yeah. So it's either do it or don't do it. Like right now, I'm I'm trying to book a, a famous promoter on the show. I actually talked to him this afternoon and it's it's just a matter of getting the scheduling out. So I'll wait, you know, but the, the key is get them on the show. Yeah. One thing I have learned that I can't do that's, you know, even though it's not much, this is commerce. And I cannot put somebody on my show that's on five other shows at the same time. It makes no sense. By the time they get around on my show, people have heard them. And it's like, why? Uh, if you've heard Joe Blow on Eddie's wrestling podcast, and then you heard him on your wrestling podcast, why would they want to listen to him on my wrestling? What's he going to say that's different? Yeah. So this is why I like to bring on guests that are on the periphery of the wrestling business and, and more, I've had a lot of book authors and journalists and what have you, because we can have interesting discussions without repeating what every other podcast is doing. I'm trying to do something different, you know, from the comedy, the music we present, I'm trying to be totally original. I don't know if it's working, <laughs> but I, I, do you think the show's good? Do you listen? <laughs> I, this is one of the very few your show and Brian Solomon's show are like the two that I listen to each and every week. I make sure that uh, that those are as soon as they get uploaded, that that's the show that I'm listening to on those days, you know, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate that coming for you. That's that's the best compliment you could pay me right there. That's no lie either. That's no lie. Folks. I've heard that several times. Yeah. And the fact that I have been able to start this silly little thing and within a year's time I was on NPR last week based on this podcast I must be doing something right yeah. but I will say that you know the grays are getting grayer and the, the bones are getting more brittle and I'm not as young as I used to be I'm starting to feel it a little bit you know I'm, I, I'm, I'm as busy now as I was during my musician days and my other days working for PWI and all that other stuff I'm maybe busier now Wow. and I feel it at night man I, I just I'm getting on my back, you know, everything, my foot, you know, everything you could talk about, I've had the last three months. It's been crazy. So yeah, the key is not learning not to overdo. That's the key. But you're right. You know, even, even the minutia of this, I enjoy the, the audio, the mixing, the, the editing. I like, I don't use another company. I do it all on my own. I, I just enjoy every aspect of this. I'm getting the rights to the music I use and, and finding advertising and whatnot. It's it's like it's been fun. I, I don't know what else to say other than I hope it translates to people who are listening to it. Yeah. I mean, I'm having a blast to doing what I'm doing right now. It's that I work 13 hour days, five days a week, and then a lot of wrestling stuff on the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, whether recording a podcast or doing some sort of play by play for a show. It's uh it was constantly bidding, but when it when it's the wrestling stuff, it's like it, Maybe tiring, but it's different, and it's worth it in the end. I think. You know, I got to give you credit for one more thing, yes, and sir. I mean this sincerely. Like, like Brian Solomon, and you're you're like Brian Solomon in this regard. With as busy as you are, you take time to be a good family man, and I, you're very proud of your family. And I think that's yeah. great. I really do. 
Well, thank you, you take the time to show pictures of your kids on Facebook and all this other stuff. And that's cool because it shows you you keep in the work life balance, even though you're working all those hours. Yeah. And if you're ever at a show, anybody here or you, Bob, you, you will see my son with me. He comes and travels with me to every show, my youngest son. So and he loves it. Uh, he loves going to it and he loves uh, just the experience. And he, a lot of times he's right up against the ring sitting there just cheering everybody up. <laughs> So, wow, that's great. All right. Tell people how they can get a hold of you and your organizations. Like, are there websites or anything like that? Well, I uh, recently started a site. Uh, well, my friend Dennis and I recently started a site uh, called ProWrestlingWire.com. We are here to give exposure to independent wrestling as a whole and the community, trying to help build a positive vibe in that. I mean, there's enough news sites out there covering the world of AEW and WWE. We just want something for the stuff that we appreciate and we like and uh i basically cover the northeast you know what i mean so mm -hmm. amongst other things um you can pro wrestling .com, like i said you can reach us through there there's also a podcast uh once in a while that goes through there me interviewing whoever or just discussing we go live every now and again on uh, youtube as well and uh that's pretty much it you can hit me up on facebook uh my name rick del santo yep but there's one other thing i think we're both forgetting and i don't mention it enough either is wfia the WFIA, the Wrestling Fans International Association, which is, uh, I am a member of the board of directors, and mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the reminder about that. Jeez. Um, it is an amazing organization. You want to like and uh, promote wrestling, and um, it's just there to support. It's amazing. It's a fun um, organization, and there's just so much. There's a monthly newsletter, which I also contribute to, uh, usually uh, some sort of writing or interview or what have you. Uh, Brad Drake and is uh, who the uh, the president of the or organization, and we got legends like George Shire and Tom Burke, which are part of the uh, I guess advisors, mm -hmm. uh, and and everybody there as that's part of the uh, board of directors is just all amazing human beings, and we're all here for one uh, one reason and that's to make uh, professional wrestling great. Well, I'll tell you what I I'm a member, and I I don't know if you've noticed on every show I run a spot. For the yes. WFIA because I believe in it, and here's why: I got excited when they and Brad reformed it because it's the same thing it always was. It's not different at all from the membership card you get in the mail to the content you get and the newsletter that you receive. And it's going to be uh, this fall, I guess, is going to be the first uh, online convention, right? Yeah, virtual virtual convention itself, mm -hmm. which. Will be very exciting. I mean, uh, there's some guests. I think Ken Patera and uh, Gary Michael Capetta, I believe, were uh, wow. now as guests. I believe that's who it was so far. Um, I do have the ad, the the trailer somewhere, and um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And oh, I think it's the High Flyers, I believe. Uh, if I oh boy, yeah. okay, yeah, that's great. I could. All I know, all I know is it's wfia.org. It's really easy yeah. to join, and it's free. Yes. You can't get any better than free. No, you can't. And and it is worth it. If you, if you, this newsletter, they have all these writers put out this great nostalgic content as well as content about today's stuff. It's, it's as good as an old school wrestling magazine. That's the way I'm going to put it. Like it yeah. reminds me of the old Kaiser books, right? Yeah. 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 There you go. You know, it has that flavor to it. Yeah. It's just not to mention the same logo they used back in the seventies, which kills me. I love that thing. Oh, I love I got, the logo, the strongman logo. I got it on a T-shirt, so there you go. I wear it to every convention I go to, and and uh, I wear it a lot. I wear it too often, I guess. It's kind of getting worn out already. So, so Rick and I are not trying to sell you people anything. We're trying to get you to join for free because it's it's going to be worth it to you, and you're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like I said, you can't get any, get. There's nothing wrong with it. You're not spending any money. It's free. You can go there. You sign up on, right online, and uh, and you know what? You get a newsletter every month, and it's uh, or is it bi monthly? It's bi monthly, is the I think it's bi monthly, and it's an e newsletter. We should mention that. But yeah. in the mail, you get this really cool old school membership card. Yeah, and, and uh, I got that. I almost fell on the floor. I was so happy. I felt like I was twelve years old again, joining the old WFIA. And you can go to Facebook actually and like uh, join the Facebook group where you can chat with guys like me and Bob and mm -hmm. uh, Brent. Yeah president uh, i mean there's a lot of people in there that are just uh you know like i said it's an amazing organization all the people are great and, and it's a i lot. just want to i just want to help it grow because yeah. i think you know what anytime you can get a consortium of fans of all different eras of wrestling in one spot i think that's good for everybody 
And I and for you, if if I do have any younger fans or fans of today's product, join it just the same. It's not all oldie stuff. It, it's like for every wrestling fan. Yes, it's not just old people like us. You know, no, it's not. It's, it's, a, lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of great people. That oh uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about, and there's monthly meetings. Uh, so you're all, uh, I believe, you're all allowed to join in. Uh, excuse me, on the meetings and um, talk about wrestling. That's pretty much it. I think there's a monthly Zoom meeting. Well, there you go. There you go. At, ladies and gentlemen, this is Rick Del Santo. He's one of a kind. I guess his. Uh, you're, you're, the podcast I met you, you were doing, is now on, I will just say it's on hiatus at this point? It's been pretty much done since uh, December. Um, I got, like I said, I got worn out towards the end of the year. Yeah. Months off, and then me and my friend uh, launched this site, so it kind of merged into that in a way. Okay. All so, right, that's cool. Yeah. You can catch so, all my old episodes on the Savoldi Ultimate Classic Wrestling Network as well, so all my old interviews. Really? I didn't know that. Yep. Uh, so uh, the interview that I did with Bob Smith is up there. You're kidding me. I'm on the Savoldi uh, Network? Yes, you are. Yep. But I'm also on the Savoldi Network being Bob Smith for PWI. If you want to go back that far, there, I'm on tons it, of those shows. Yeah. So if, if you want to check out what I look like with hair, with a lot of hair, <laughs> tune in. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in. Did I have long hair at that point? I don't remember. I, I remember one point at, late in my PWI, I just decided not to get a haircut for a few months. And it looked like I was wearing a British judge's wig. I, I had this huge mane of curly, thick hair. I know when I did announcing for ECW with Wayne Manor a couple of times, I had way too much hair. I mean, I just didn't cut it. I just, it wasn't even a vanity thing or I wasn't trying for anything. I just, Never cut it. You know why? Because I was busy then as I am now. That's why. Go through that. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Right now I need to get a haircut. So what can I tell you? But Rick Santo looks good. He sounds good. He is good for wrestling. And Rick, what a pleasure, man. Thanks again for being here. Thank you for having me again. Please Thank come you. back. I, I say that without reservation. Please come back at your earliest convenience and uh, keep me abreast of everything that's going on. All right. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Wrestling Fans International Association is back. That's right, the premier fan club association of the 1970s and 1980s has been revived and is back in business. Join today. It's free at the WFIA.org. That's T-H-E-W-F-I-A dot org. You can also join us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash groups slash WFIA 1969. Well, there's another one kind of in the can. Thank you again, Rick Del Santo, for being on our show a second time. I really appreciate it. He's a busy, busy guy, and he does exemplary work no matter what he's doing. And a real class act. I really like Rick. I hope he feels the same way about me. One of the great joys of doing this podcast is meeting people like Rick Del Santo. I have I have lavished him with praise, even when he's not here, on other podcasts that I've at, done, and I really mean it. And he's just as good as it gets. He really is. Knows his stuff like crazy, too. So I'm kind of rushed releasing this particular production because uh, of WrestleMania. Coming up, we're going to have a great look at Memphis with Mayor John McCall, a very special program. We have another list in the works. Wink, wink, hint, hint. I think you can all guess what we're going to do. Me and a couple guys I worked with a couple months ago. You remember that, don't you? We got Craig Peters coming on. We're going to have some laughs with Craig. It's going to be a, a, the first ever outdated wrestling comedy hour and so much more. Until then, find us on Facebook. I'm Bob Smith, the guy singing with BB King. Write to me at outdatedwrestling at gmail.com. Find our website, outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. You can listen to every one of our shows right there or on any podcast app that you can name, I'm pretty sure. You can join the Outdated Wrestling Hour fan club for a couple of bucks a month. You can help perpetuate our program, and we'll have uh, periodic Zoom meetings, and I'll send you some stuff in the Gmails, too, just to read and have some fun with. So that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this one. 
This is the outdated wrestling hour, deep in a year or two now, four months in. And they said it wouldn't last, right? My name's Bob Smith. We'll see you soon, as Ringo Starr always says. Peace and love, brothers. Peace and love. <laughs>